Good evening, everyone. You're very welcome to the HSE Midwest Community Healthcare Health and Wellbeing webinar, Menopause and Me. Just before I hand you over to your host for today, Bedelia Collins, a little bit of housekeeping to do. The panel will be delighted to receive any questions you may have. Please use the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your PC or laptop screen. If you're using an iPad, you will find this feature located at the top of your screen. There will be plenty of time for questions and answers, so please get your questions in for the panel. The raise hand function will be disabled this evening. Also, just to mention, we have Anita Kaneen and Catherine White joining us as the sign language interpreter, and they will be visible on the screen for the duration of the webinar. We also invite you to take part in our poll. We ask you two simple questions at the start of the webinar and three questions at the end of the webinar. You don't have to take part if you don't want to, but we wanted to make sure that the following webinar meet, met our audience's needs. The information will also inform future work we do around the topic of menopause. So without further ado, I will now play you a short video and hand you over to your host, Health and Wellbeing Manager, Bedelia Collins. Thank you. Menopause is not just a time frame. It's a stage of life, really, because you're looking at it you know, you're entering a perimenopausal stage, you're in menopause and then you're postmenopause. Everybody can wonder, but everybody's in, individual people go through different stages of menopause. Every, nobody's the same. That's all I can say. I mean, I've, I wouldn't compare myself with anybody else because my situation was totally different from my sister's. And I mean, we were all the same family and we were going through different things. So everybody goes through different things at their own stage, like. I'm still navigating it. I'm, um, I, I've, I've, as a nurse, midwife, public health nurse, I've realised I'm totally uneducated about it, um, both as all of those and as a woman. Um, that was my first really big thing. I thought, God, I really haven't a clue. Not a clue. Um, I was Googling symptoms. So we have maternity leave, we have paternity leave, not every woman has the privilege of having a baby. Every woman will have menopause. Every one of us. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Menopause and Me. My name is Bedelia Collins, and I'm your chair for the evening. We're all very excited here um, in Health and Wellbeing, HSE Midwest Community Healthcare Area who are your hosts for the evening. So um, a lot of work has gone into today, a lot of planning, and we have a lot of great speakers for you to hear from. Um, we have two cohorts this evening. We have our healthcare professionals who are going to outline for you today some of the evidence-based practice that you can take into your life uh, to make living with menopause that little bit easier for you. Um, and also very importantly today, we've got a group of six wonderful women who have kindly agreed to share their menopause experience and what it's like for them living with menopause. And I'm just going to name them now because I want to thank them now before we forget. And it's Mary Cashman, Catherine Quinlevin, Liz Fitzmaurice, Geraldine Carey, Idel O'Keefe and Noelle Clancy. And you're going to hear from these women throughout the night um, as we pose different questions to them. Okay, so let's get started. And we're going to meet our first guest tonight. Um, it's Anne Ryan, who's Head of Service for Health and Wellbeing. Um, and Anne is going to open up our, our webinar tonight. Welcome, Anne. Thank you, Bedelia, and welcome to everyone. So as, as, as Head of Health and Wellbeing Midwest Community Healthcare, I'm delighted to invite you to this webinar. Um, this initially commenced as a staff health and wellbeing initiative, and very early on, we realized the level of interest much wider than staff, and so extended the invite to all of our community partners, families, and friends. Um, I suppose menopause is such a significant part of a woman's journey in life and the effects, the effects can be so underestimated. 
uh, only in recent times it's been spoken about and awareness has been created. So I hope going forward by op our open sharing that we can make it an easier and more supported journey. Um, we have a commitment to staff and the wider uh, Midwest community to ensure that menopause is on our health and wellbeing agenda. Um, it's very evident from the level of interest shown with over 700 registering for this event that this is the start of a conversation and I've no doubt will expand into further initiatives on the topic. Um, so like every stage in life, uh, when we talk and laugh about it, we learn and we relax. Uh, menopause is a life transition. It is not an illness. Um, so I suppose just to give some background facts, uh, in September 2019, the Department of Health created the Women's Health Task Force, which sought to improve women's health outcomes and experiences of healthcare. Um, improved support for menopause was identified as one of the four initial key priorities. So currently in the Midwest, there are 58,764 women aged between 45 and 64 years of age. And the HSE estimates that eight out of 10 women experience symptoms leading up to the menopause. And of these 45% find their symptoms difficult to deal with. So the menopause is without doubt a significant topic that encompasses a wide variety of areas covering physio physiological, psychological, behavioural and social aspects. Um, I suppose two of the key findings from the final menopause report, experiences and health behaviours of menopausal women in Ireland, were that women's, uh, the menopause impacts women in a variety of ways and that women lack information and support to manage menopause. So I suppose I hope from tonight's event that you are provided with evidence-based information, that you feel empowered to know what to ask your healthcare provider, uh, that it raises awareness about perimenopause and menopause, um, that it affirms and validates women's experiences and that it signposts help available for women to mind physical, mental and social health, well, health and well-being within the Midwest. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Padilla Collins and her team in health and well-being for all the work they've put in to bring this to fruition and thank all the speakers in advance for what will be a very informative first step in the journey for women, both working within Midwest Community Healthcare and the wider Midwest community. Um, all of our experiences will be different and all of our experiences will be unique. Uh, from a personal perspective, as a result of surgery, I fast-tracked straight into the menopause overnight. But what is important is that we are informed, we are supported, and empowered to live um, this life's transition to the full. Um, so before I hand you over to hopefully a very enjoyable night, I'm just going to leave you with a final quote from um, Maya Angelou. Uh, we delight in the beauty of a butterfly, but rarely admit the changes it has gone through to achieve that beauty. So thank you. Thank you, Anne. Um, and thank you for sharing your own experience um, like many women are doing here tonight. And I think that's what's really important is that tonight is about a conversation that will hopefully go beyond tonight and that we'll all start having that chat with our friends and feeling a bit more comfortable and confident about having the conversation moving forward. Um, tonight, as Anne rightly pointed out, is about highlighting menopause as a transition in life, okay, um, and, and not an illness, as she says. Um, and so it's really important. And we're going to hear a lot about that from our speakers as we go on. So now I'm going to go back to uh, my six women, which I referred to earlier on. Um, and we're going to hear a little bit more about them. We asked them the question, can you tell us about your menopause? And let's hear a little bit more. I think it started sometime in my mid 40s, but I didn't recognize it as such. So it, but it really became problematic when I was about 48. And I, I, I know that year so well because I was hardly functioning. I had changed jobs. I was, and I was becoming very symptomatic. I was getting, I was getting hot flushes, not really recognizing them for what they were. I definitely couldn't sleep at night. I was waking up in the morning. It was like I'd been in a, in a swimming pool all night doing laps when I got, you know, and waking several times during the night, having to change my clothes, change the sheets, all that kind of thing. 
um, and I wouldn't be a hectic sleeper anyway. So this was really affecting, the thing about it was, it was affecting my performance at work so badly. I was praying for it. I was saying, oh, I hope I can't wait to go into the menopause now because I'll get no more migraine headaches and I'll get no more period and I'll have no more backache and I'll have no more cramps in my stomach. And then it crept up on me slowly and I was thinking to myself, this isn't all it's cracked up to be at all. I'm devastated. I was actually devastated. Like, you were going for a few months without a period, and then you get it for a few months, and then it was gone again, and then it was coming back again. And I was thinking, like, I thought it was supposed to stop, and this is it. And it didn't for about, I'd say, I was kind of going in the, the beginning, early stages of it, for about two years, and then eventually, about four years ago, it stopped. But I've been getting hot flushes for about six years, eight years maybe, and they're horrible, horrible things. They actually are. You're Grand one second and then the next minute with me, mine come out on my face, my neck and the, down my back, the sweat runs off of me and I get all um, panicky and jittery. And then there's ones, I call them the wobblies. I know it sounds stupid, but I haven't, these are the worst ones then that you get. It's like, um, it's like a panic attack and a hot flush all in one go and you find, I find that I get disoriented. I don't know where I am. And I didn't go through the menopause until I was about 52. No, about 53, yeah, about 53, yeah. about four years now. And um, it's horrible, cranky, sweaty, anxiety attacks, panic attacks, horrible. I think it started on my 40th birthday. I, I really, that's how weird it is. I had it, um, I'm a Christmas baby and I had a party organised for my 40th and I felt really anxious, which wouldn't be me. And um, I remember going in and out of the toilet and I thought, God, what's going on? And then I thought maybe it was just the pressure of organising it. But that's when I can, and I'm 48 now, am I? What age am I? Yeah, 48. See, that's the other thing. Brain fog, word finding. In my job, that's very, very difficult and that's what I struggle with the most. Um, I could be mid-sentence and not know what's next. I also could be thinking of um, awards and I have the most amazing colleague um, colleagues that I work with and we now laugh at it because I call it charades and we go two syllables sounds like so eventually I'll get the word out but it's it's horrible it's I struggle with it hugely I find it very upsetting actually at times but I've learned to navigate it and try and laugh through it in one way. 2011 I got diagnosed with breast cancer so um, that kind of really put the cat amongst the pigeons entirely so menopause was the least of my worries but we used to call it chemopause because it obviously accelerates or brings on symptoms that would be similar to menopause or would put you into a menopause state but I would definitely get the hot flushes at stages or um, for me it's actually insomnia is my killer of waking up at night and getting the flushes or you know the night sweats and stuff like that and I suppose it's isn't it a vicious circle when you think about it so if you're not getting quality sleep you're not getting you're not able to focus maybe or you're not able to do what you don't have the same energy as in you normally would so you'd be looking at okay well how can I manage this or what can I do Okay, so I think you'll find that for a lot of you, you may be able to relate to it. And for those who are maybe earlier on in your journey, there's a lot of information on that. And just to thank the, the women again for sharing those experiences. So now we're going to look at what menopause. What actually is it? How do we diagnose it? What are the symptoms? And what's HRT and what's that all about? So our first speaker tonight is a lady called Dr. Cassie McVie. She's a vocational trained GP with special interest in menopause and its management. Dr. McVie is passionate about education and empowering women to manage their menopause through evidence-based medicine and lifestyle modification so that they can live a healthy and fulfilled life through their menopause and beyond. Dr. McVie, you're very welcome. Over to you. Thanks very much. Um, so thank you very much for asking me to speak at the Menopause and Me webinar tonight. It's a real honor. Um, to be here with everybody and I'm really looking forward to learning a lot more uh, over the course of the evening. 
Um, so I work in Sligo, uh, both as a GP and two days a week, I work in um, my clinic called Vitality Clinic, which is um, pretty much exclusively um, manages menopause for women and, and discusses lifestyle and so on with them. So I'm really enjoying doing that at the moment. Um, so menopause, what is it? It's um, defined as the end of the menstrual cycle. And it results from the shutting down of the ovaries, marking the end of our reproductive years. Um, so during our reproductive years, our ovaries produce most of our estrogen, progesterone and testosterone. Um, and the average age of menopause in the UK and Ireland is 51. It's something all women are going to go through if they live long enough. Um, and a woman is considered postmenopausal once she's not had a period for one year and is not on hormonal contraception or doesn't have any other explanation for her lack of periods. A surgical menopause um, is when a woman has her ovaries removed. And um, this can occur at any age, such as in women undergoing surgery for a gynecological malignancy, like cervical cancer or something like that. Women can also go into menopause from cancer treatments, um, such as chemotherapy and, and radiation. And as the lovely smiley lady with the red lipstick was talking about, um, how some of the breast cancer treatments can um, put, basically shut down your ovaries and put you into a menopausal state. Women with autoimmune disease, such as thyroid disease, rheumatoid arthritis, they have a higher risk of premature menopause. Um, and menopause for some women, and I see this um, quite frequently, can be precipitated by an emotional trauma, such as the death of a parent, um, maybe a marriage breakdown, that kind of thing. So perimenopause is something we've been hearing a lot about at the moment, and perhaps um, before this year, a few people maybe had heard of it at all or knew what it was. Perimenopause refers to the time around the menopause, and it's also called the menopausal transition. Women will start their perimenopause at different ages. Uh, we usually say that around about 10 years before the age of menopause, women will develop very subtle symptoms, which can begin as early um, as the early 40s or even late 30s. Perimenopause tends to be a bit of a roller coaster because it it's a time of hormonal fluctuations where one minute we can have high estrogen and the next we have low estrogen. Um, and that can lead to days or weeks when we feel okay and other times where we feel awful. So it's hard to kind of know what's going on. In terms of symptoms of menopause or perimenopause, so the symptoms of both are kind of similar. Um, there's about 33 different recognized symptoms of menopause, um, but there are likely to be many more than that. We use um, a system called the Greens Criteria for uh, it's kind of a questionnaire that women can fill out. Um, it's available on my website, but it's available in lots of lots of different places. Um, and you can fill that out where the symptoms are graded zero to two. And you use that to sort of assess how menopausal you may be. There's also an app called Balance App. Um, which is, uh, has been released by Louise Newson's team over in the UK. Um, it's a really good app for learning more about your menopause, tracking your symptoms, that kind of thing. Uh, and I know a lot of um, women are involved in um, the Irish Menopause Facebook page, which has been really um, massively helpful for women gaining information and support for each other. So traditionally, we thought of menopause as hot flushes, night sweats, maybe a bit of moodiness, some tearfulness. Um, but now we're starting to recognize that the symptoms of menopause and perimenopause are much more nuanced than that. So in my clinic, probably the main symptoms I see are poor sleep, migraines, new onset of anxiety, loss of self-confidence, including loss of body confidence, low mood, palpitations are very common, tiredness, loss of sex drive, painful intercourse, weight gain, aches and pains, particularly in the shoulders. And weirdly, the thumb joints tend to be a really common place as well. I just want to mention weight gain specifically because it probably affects most of the women I see and even affects women for whom weight has never been an issue. And as we lose estrogen, we become sort of more apple than pear shaped. So we tend to become more of a shape that we would traditionally associate with men. And when we put on weight in that area, we start to see an increased cardiovascular risk. So that's an increased risk of heart attack and stroke. It's worth mentioning women who smoke or who are overweight do tend to suffer from more hot flushes and generally have a tougher menopause than women who don't. Um, and I think the main point is that every menopause is different. So you won't necessarily menopause the same way as your mum, although you may menopause at a similar time as your mother. You won't menopause like your sister or your friends. And because of that, a woman's menopause will need to be managed differently for each person. And there's no need to fail just because your menopause seems to be particularly tough that you're failing in any way. So why is it so difficult to get help? 
Um, I guess we failed in an education um, in the area of education for women. So women aren't educated in what to look out for in terms of the menopausal symptoms. So they don't really know what's wrong with them when they can't sleep or they become very anxious or forgetful or unable to cope. So lots of women go on Google and they end up thinking that they have dementia or uh, they have something wrong with their heart or that kind of thing. It's also difficult because some healthcare providers are not trained to recognize these symptoms as menopausal symptoms, although thankfully this is rapidly changing with recent public menopause awareness campaigns and increasing access to menopause training. As doctors, we were taught for many years about the dangers of HRT, and we were told that if we had to prescribe it, to give it at the lowest dose for the shortest time, and it will take quite a long time for this thinking to change across the board. But personally, I have to say, a lot of GPs I know are excellent in the management of menopause, and I think that's a good uh, thing to know. Um, it's important to mention that women in lower socioeconomic groups and those in ethnic minorities in general have less access to education on menopause and less access to HRT. So this is an inequality that needs to change. And hopefully with the new menopause clinics, which are planned in the HSC and more availability of education for our GPs, it should improve access to good menopause care for all. Talking about menopause in the workplace, um, given that we're talking uh, in, in, within the HSC setting, 40% of the workforce in the NHS are menopausal. And it's probably fair to extrapolate that number roughly to the HSC as well. A poorly managed menopause is a very common factor in women deciding to cut back their hours at work, not going for promotion or taking early retirement. And this is a shame because it coincides with the time in life when they have the most to give in terms of knowledge and experience in the workplace. Society has to realise that menopausal women are amongst the most valuable members of the workforce and that a well-managed menopause in the workplace is a positive thing for all of us. In terms of home life, we often talk about the sandwich generation, and that refers to a time in life where women have maybe teenage children. So they're kind of, they say puberty is a bit like a reverse menopause. Uh, so there's a little bit of a clash of hormonal issues in many families. Aging parents can cause a burden of care, escalating work pressures, relationship pressures, uh, particularly for same sex couples, it can be especially difficult because they can both be going through the menopause at the same time and perhaps having very different menopauses. So that could put a lot of stress on, on couples too. The recent trend talking about menopause can only be a good thing in my opinion, in that close members of our family and our work colleagues can have an insight into the changes that we are coping with. How do we diagnose menopause? Um, so in women under, over the age of 45, the NICE guidelines, which are the guidelines that GPs and other doctors operate under, recommend that we diagnose menopause without blood tests and base it on clinical symptoms. In women under 45, the guidelines recommend blood tests just to rule out other potential causes of symptoms, such as an overactive or underactive thyroid. In practice, it's probably a good idea to have an up-to-date thyroid function test for all midlife women, because symptoms of thyroid are very much like the menopause, and indeed, they often go hand in hand in this age group of women. The other blood tests we do very commonly is an FSH or an LH, and these are the follicle stimulating hormones and the luteinizing hormones. If these are elevated, they can signal a woman is transitioning to menopause, but they could be up and elevated one week and they could be normal again the next week. So just because they're up once doesn't mean that they're going to be up a second time as well. So the, I suppose the take home message here is that normal hormonal bloods in a woman under 45 do not mean that she is not suffering from menopausal symptoms. And so clinical history is the most important tool in diagnosis at all ages. What to consider at the time of menopause. So when I see patients, I look at it as a really good time to take stock of things looking at our lifestyle, putting into place changes that will stand to us in terms of our best future health. So it's not just a time to survive, it's a time to thrive. I always chat to women about their diet, frequency and type of exercise leaning towards weight bearing exercise, but also bearing in mind that the exercise you do has to be something you like or you're not gonna stick at it. I talk about smoking status, it's a really good time to stop as any time is, and alcohol intake, just a quick word on alcohol. I, I find it's a particular issue for my midlife women. Women often start to drink more around the time of the menopause to cope with symptoms such as anxiety and poor sleep. But unfortunately, we know that alcohol generally leads to more problems than it fixes, and many women find it actually makes their menopause symptoms worse. Dietary factors such as adequate vitamin D, calcium, and omega-3 oils are what I recommend for um, pretty much all of the patients, but uh, I know somebody will be going into this in more detail later on. Pelvic health is important, issues with vaginal dryness, incontinence, painful intercourse, that's important for all women, whether they've had children, whether they're sexually active. A healthy vagina is really important for all of us. Um, also screening, making sure smears and mammograms are up to date. 
a mammogram is not indicated when starting HRT, but it's a good idea to make sure that if you're over 50, you're registered with breast check. Uh, DEXA scans can be done to assess bone density and um, they don't need to be done for all women. So um, your doctor can use a tool called the FRAX tool and that's available online. And using the FRAX tool, we can determine whether you're high, medium or low risk and determine whether you need a DEXA scan based on that. Before we talk about HRT, I just want to quickly mention some non-hormonal options for menopausal women. And this is especially important for women who, for whatever reason, cannot have HRT, such as a history of hormone-dependent cancers. In these women, lifestyle becomes particularly important because it's their main weapon in the armory against menopause. In women with hot flushes and low mood, antidepressants can be very helpful. And there are a number of other medications, which I won't get into here, but could be discussed with your GP or healthcare provider. Sadly, there's not much in the way of evidence for nutritional supplements with the exception of red clover extract, which does have some evidence in the reduction of hot flushes. Um, lots of women take black gohosh as well and seem to find that it helps. The evidence isn't great for, the, for that, but you know, if it helps, it doesn't really matter if the evidence is there or not. Um, CBT and yoga have some good evidence um, for the reduction of hot flushes. Um, and interesting, we know Japanese women experience fewer hot flushes and night sweats, which is likely because of their high soya diet. Um, a vegetarian diet or one lower in meat has been linked to fewer hot flushes. Brain exercises are important for the brain fog. There'll be puzzles, jigsaws, crosswords, that kind of thing. Uh, lots of women find acupuncture, reflexology and other alternative practices really helpful. And while the evidence is scant in this area, each woman is different and many women report great benefit from these approaches. So in my opinion, whatever works for each individual woman is the most important thing of all. So in the discussion of HRT, I suppose I'll start with the elephant in the room, which is always breast cancer. Um, just to say our baseline risk of breast cancer as females is pretty high. So it's roughly one in seven or one in eight. Some of us have higher risk factors and some of us are a little bit lower. The biggest risk factor for all women really is obesity. And the biggest reducer of risk is regular exercise. The good news is that women who are diagnosed with breast cancer, 90% of those women will still be alive at five years following their diagnosis. So although it's, it's a very shocking and difficult diagnosis, the treatments have got so good these days that most of the women will survive and thrive following a diagnosis of breast cancer. So why is HRT linked to breast cancer? So roughly 20 years ago, a number of studies came out linking HRT to breast cancer. The main one of these was the women's health concern. It's probably the best known. And it was later shown to have incorrect, been incorrectly reported and resulted in millions of women stopping HRT. This resulted in a higher incidence of heart disease and fractures, but it didn't have a huge impact on the um, incidence of breast cancer. In fact, breast cancer incidence didn't really decline at all, despite how many million women stopped taking HRT. So how many additional breast cancers are we talking? So the Women's Health Concern reported an additional four cases of breast cancer per thousand women aged 50 to 59 taking continuous combined HRT. So that's roughly one case per year per thousand women. To put this in context, women who drink a large glass of wine every day have an additional five cases per thousand women. So that's one higher than taking HRT. Women who have a body mass index of over 30 have an additional 24 cases of breast cancer per thousand women. Women who take the combined oral contraceptive pill, so that's the same uh, pill that we give our 16 year old daughters and I'm sure we took ourselves, they have an additional four cases per thousand women, so that's the same risk as taking HRT. And interestingly for women taking estrogen only HRT, so that's women who've had a hysterectomy, and um, the risk of breast cancer was actually found to be lower in those women than women not taking HRT. So it's generally considered that oestrogen is not a carcinogen in that it doesn't cause breast cancer, but it accelerates the growth of abnormal breast cells, which were already present um, before starting HRT. It's worth remembering that women diagnosed with breast cancer whilst on HRT do not have a higher risk of death than those diagnosed with breast cancer who are not on HRT. So what are the big killers of women? Osteoporotic fractures, heart disease and stroke and dementia. And what do women who get breast cancer ultimately die from? The vast majority of them die from heart disease, stroke, osteoporotic fracture and dementia. So in terms of osteoporotic fractures, um, women have a one in six lifetime risk of a hip fracture. So they have a higher lifetime risk of a hip fracture than they do of breast cancer. And of women who fracture their hips, 30% of those women will be dead within the first year of their fractured hip. And that could be from uh, blood clots, hospital acquired infections and um, those kind of things. 
we're not talking about elderly women here, particularly we start to see hip fractures in women from their 60s and 70s onwards. So why is modern HRT considered to be safer? So the studies that we mentioned or mentioned before, we're looking at women using older types of synthetic hormones at much higher doses than we now use. The women were of an average age of 62. So <clears throat> they were quite a bit older than the women we commonly prescribe HRT for or start HRT on. Many of them were suffering from obesity and the HRT they got was administered orally. So it's generally not a good comparison to the HRT we use now. We use body identical hormones these days, which are derived from yam root extract. These hormones are very similar to what we produce ourselves. We use them in lower doses in younger women and the estrogen is given through the skin. So in terms of benefits of HRT, we see a reduced risk of osteoporosis um, and fractures, reduced risk of heart disease and stroke. Those are both in the region of 30 to 40 percent reduction. Potentially, there's a reduced risk of dementia. So the studies are kind of in their infancy for dementia risk, and there does seem to be um, more reduced risk the earlier you start your HRT. So the sooner um, after you finish your periods or even in the perimenopause seems to be more protective for dementia. It, uh, HRT is a recommended treatment for low mood in women as a result of the menopause. Many women report more energy, reduced aches and pains. It can often help with migraines, which do tend to become more common around the time of menopause. But it is important to note that HRT is not a panacea, panacea and women may have other causes for their health issues. So we can't blame everything on the menopause, although it, it has a lot to answer for. So in terms of accessing HRT, modern HRT is a very safe product when used through the skin in a twice weekly patch or gel. Whilst not everybody wants to take HRT, I think women should be aware of the long-term benefits of it so they can make an informed decision. There are very few women who are not suitable for this type of HRT should they wish to take it. So those with a family history of breast cancer, personal or family or a personal history of family or sorry, a personal or family history of blood clots, women who smoke or are obese can all safely be prescribed these products. This type of HRT is widely available through your local GP. So you don't need to come to you know, a menopause doctor to get your HRT. It's also available free of charge to those with a medical card. And do bear in mind that it might take a few visits to your GP to get started on HRT. Um, it could, you know, there's a lot to discuss. Maybe bring a Greens Criteria questionnaire with you so you can think of your symptoms more easily. You need your blood pressure well controlled and your other cardiovascular risks well managed. So that's your um, cholesterol and things like that. After starting HRT, you should be reviewed at three months and then once a year. It can often take time to notice an improvement. And for some women, it can take a few adjustments to get the right regime. Uh, for example, some women would find that a patch works better than a gel. Some women do better with synth synthetic hormones than, or synthetic progesterone than body identical progesterone. So everybody's different. HRT can be taken for as long as the benefits outweigh the risks, which other than the development of a hormone driven cancer usually tends to be indefinitely. Common side effects are bloating, breast tenderness, and vaginal spotting. These usually settle within the first three months. It's worth noting that any bleeding more than a year after you've finished your period should be investigated whether you're on HRT or not. And vaginal bleeding after six months on HRT may need investigated too. All women are suitable for vaginal estrogen, which can be given a very useful to reduce um, urinary tract infections and make intercourse more comfortable. So just to finish on a positive note, um, I'm really happy to be involved in menopause care for women at a time where it's finally becoming a mainstream topic of conversation. Women are educating themselves and supporting each other through this difficult time in their lives so that they no longer have to feel ashamed and isolated by their symptoms or feel that they are giving in by choosing to opt for HRT. I view the menopause as a time for positive change to get ourselves in the best health we can to ensure that we are able to live into old age with the best health possible. Thank you for listening. Dr. McVie, that was really wonderful. Um, so informative. Um, and I just want to say to everybody, um, tonight's session has been recorded. So if any of you want to watch back on any of the presentations, just in case there's detail you missed, um, you will get the recording in the next week. Um, so look, that was really wonderful. I, I learned so much myself. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. So we'll just move on now. And our next presenter tonight is um, Charlene Highland. Um, Charlene is a chartered physiotherapist that works in UL Hospital Group, um, our healthcare partners here in the Midwest. Um, so Charlene has uh, works as a physiotherapist and has um, an interest in women's health. 
She, she has experience in working with women with urinary incontinence, urgency, prolapse, and pelvic girdle dysfunction. She is currently completing a postgraduate studies in women's health through the University of Brunel. So um, Charlene has kindly recorded her, her um, presentation a little bit earlier for us. So we're just gonna start that now. Thank you. Good evening, ladies. My name is Charlene Highland. I'm a women's health physiotherapist working in Nina General Hospital. I'm delighted to be here tonight on behalf of a group of women's health physios in the Midwest to speak to you about the role of women's health physiotherapy in menopause. The content that we are going to discuss is what exactly is a women's health physio? Before tonight, a lot of you may not even have been aware that we existed. We're then going to look at menopause and in particular, the hormonal changes and the effects of this on some symptoms that you may experience. We will discuss symptom management, when to see a women's health physiotherapist, how you can control the controllable, and then we'll finish off by looking at bone health and the protective role of exercise, in particular, pelvic floor exercises. We all know that urinary incontinence can affect up to one in three women. Just because something is very common does not mean it's normal and does not mean that you have to live with it. So the role of a women's health physiotherapist. We are a group of physiotherapists who have undergone postgraduate training in the area of obstetrics and gynecology. We treat women throughout the lifespan, from antenatal to postnatal, right through to our elderly patients with incontinence. Some of the conditions that we treat include women with painful bladder and bowel dysfunctions, chronic pelvic pain, dyspareunia, another word for painful sex, interstitial cystitis, painful bladder syndrome, prolapse, and we also work in the maternity hospitals treating women antenatally and postnatally. A huge part of our role is to promote awareness and educate women on healthy bladder and bowel habits and on that protective role um, of exercise. When we think about menopause, we know that the definition for menopause is the absence of periods for greater than 12 months. However, more importantly, it's linked to the depletion of estrogen. And this is a fabulous slide that shows the um, levels of estrogen throughout our lifespan. So let's look at the levels of estrogen throughout the lifespan. During puberty, you see that sharp rise in estrogen. And then as we enter adolescence and our menstrual cycle begins, we have the plateauing effect of estrogen. We then see a sharp rise um, as some women enter into pregnancy. And the role of estrogen here is to prepare um, your body for pregnancy and delivery and for breastfeeding. And then after pregnancy, we get that sharp decline in estrogen levels. And then once your period starts again, you again get the fluctuations. And then we enter perimenopause. Perimenopause means around menopause and refers to the time during which your body makes the natural transition to menopause, marking the end of the reproductive years. Perimenopause typically starts from early to mid 40s and it can last up to 10 years. And if you see in our graph, again, you've got the fluctuations in the estrogen levels and that corresponds with fluctuating periods. You might find that you get your period one month and then it's another two or three months before you have a next period. And you may at this stage also be starting to experience some of the symptoms of menopause. What's really important and what I'd like a lot of women to take away from tonight, especially women in their early to mid 40s, is to track your period health, okay? A fabulous women's health physio, Michelle Lyons, calls the period our fifth vital sign. It's really important. We all know um, our phones inside out, but we really want to know our bodies as well. And for women to know your period health is so, so important. Then as we enter menopause, um, at the end of menopause, we see that depletion of estrogen. The other important hormone that I'd like to mention here is the follicle stimulating hormone. It encourages estrogen production. Its levels will start to increase in menopause in a bid to stimulate um, estrogen production. So what are the roles of estrogen or the function of estrogen in our body? Estrogen has a big part to play in puberty and sexual development. This name for this estrogen is estradiol and it's the estrogen that is 
um, important for developing your reproductive system pubic hair, the hair under your arms, and development of your breast tissue are all thanks to estrogen. Then it has a role in the menstrual cycle. It builds the lining of the uterus in anticipation for pregnancy. If no pregnancy occurs, estrogen enables the uterus to shed, enables you to shed the lining of your uterus. Another huge role for estrogen um, as estrogen is an anabolic hormone, is to build healthy bones. And it protects your bones against the loss of bone mass. And this is something we'll talk about when we look at the bone health. As estrogen is an anabolic hormone, it also is important for muscle, tendon, and ligament health. And again, I would often have chats with musculoskeletal physios as to why women in mid to late 40s and early 50s are presenting with bilateral lower limb tendinopathies. And that's a huge, um, a huge role is that depletion of estrogen. Did you know also that estrogen plays a major role in our heart health? This helpful hormone helps keep the vessels healthy and pliant and controls our cholesterol. Finally, estrogen boosts our mood. It boosts the production of serotonin, and that is a chemical that will help balance our mood. So this leads us on to some of those common symptoms that you may experience. Symptoms such as depression, anxiety, memory loss, otherwise known as brain fog, headache. And again, if we look back on that previous slide on the role of estrogen and the production of serotonin, we can see why it needs, might lead to symptoms like so. And the other symptoms are hot flushes, increased weight gain, joint pain, and the night sweats. And then if we look at the two circles, we've got urological symptoms and vaginal symptoms. I'm gonna focus on how physiotherapy can help with some of these symptoms. So the urological symptoms got to do with the urinary tract and the bladder. You can get your urgency, frequency, dysuria, pain when passing urine, and incontinence. In terms of vaginal symptoms, you often get experience vaginal dryness, which can contribute to urinary tract infections. You may have itching, atrophy, tinning of the muscles in the pelvic floor, and again, dyspareunia or painful sex syndrome. So next slide, we are going to focus on symptom management, and we're looking at those symptoms of urgency and frequency. And this is a significant um, and women's health physios have a significant role in helping women to manage and improve these symptoms. So urinary frequency is defined as going to the toilet more than seven times during the day and more than once at night. And what we would say is when we have women who present with conditions like this, it can be very limiting because if you're at work, it's really hard and you have to get up really frequently to go to the toilet. What we start with is we start with getting you to fill in a bladder diary. This is really important as it enables us to look at your fluid intake and your output. It tells us a lot about how the kidneys are functioning. And really importantly, it helps us to see that you are, you know, getting good amount of fluid into your diet because oftentimes if you're constantly going to the toilet you might think of cutting back on your fluid intake but you should not do this we recommend you take 1.5 liters of fluid a day things that we might recommend you putting back on include caffeine and tea and coke these are all bladder irritants so as part of our role we will educate and advise you on how to manage the frequency the other thing that we will look at is your bowel health and remember, an empty rectum makes a happy bowel and a happy bowel makes a happy bladder. So I always describe it to women as you've got your pelvic floor and muscles, and then sitting on top of the pelvic floor, you've got your bladder, your uterus, and at the back, you've got your bowel. And if you're somebody who suffers a lot with constipation and your bowel quite full, that's going to put pressure on the uterus, onto the bladder, and that in itself will contribute to some frequency. We then mentioned urinary incontinence. And again, one in three. This may have been something that you've had um, since, since you've given birth and you've just got on with it. But it's really, really important um, that you seek help and see a women's health physiotherapist. If you were somebody, in this slide, I've divided urinary incontinence into stress and urge incontinence. There are other types of incontinence, but for this presentation, we'll focus on stress and urge incontinence. Stress 
your enemy incontinent is that sudden urge is that is when you need to go to the toilet on um, any physical exertion or increased intra-abdominal pressure like you cough or sneeze and you might have a little leak. If you're somebody who purely just has that stress incontinence, so you leak when you cough or sneeze, or you're out for a walk and you're, you know, walking very briskly and you get the leak, then pelvic floor muscle exercise is that gold standard treatment. It has been recommended in the NICE guidelines on the management of urinary incontinence. And the exercise prescription, it would be that you do your pelvic floor exercises three times a day and 10 repetitions. We also teach the NAP which is a faster contraction and it works on the timing of the pelvic floor muscles. However, as we often see as women's health physios, sometimes it's not as clear cut as somebody just having stress incontinence. So you do benefit from that review by a women's health physio if there are other things going on, because as part of our treatment, we can assess the pelvic floor muscles internally by palpation, digital palpation, and we can feel what is going on. Are your pelvic muscles very, very weak, in which case you would benefit from these exercises? Or on the other hand, have you got a lot of overactivity, really tight and painful pelvic floor muscles that are just not contracting and relaxing optimally, in which case you might need other forms of treatment before we would go down the exercise prescription route. Then if we look at urge incontinency, urge urinary incontinence, this is when the bladder muscles squeeze incorrectly or lose the ability to relax. And you're getting that constant urge to go to the toilet, okay? That may be accompanied by frequency. Again, here, our role is to look at the bladder retraining. We will give you advice to stop going to the toilet just in case. And positioning on the toilet. A lot of women, you know, we're very busy. It's our nature to be rushing around. We don't maybe stop and sit on the toilet correctly, you know, and maybe if you're in work you're not comfortable using you know sitting completely on the toilet seat but this is something we do not recommend you need to be seated to relax everything to relax your pelvic floor to allow um that passing of urine and this is particularly important your positioning on the toilet for your bowel health as well and we mentioned earlier that at all is linked so these are conditions that i don't want you to suffer in silence with you can get a referral from your GP and be referred to a women's health physiotherapist. I have also linked at the back the ISCP where they have a list of chartered physiotherapists who specialize in women's health. Okay. Okay. The really good news is that if it's stress urinary incontinence alone, research has found that up to 74% of women will show improvement after pelvic floor muscle training. So now I just want to take a little break and, and get you all engaged in activating your pelvic floor muscles. So if we look at the diagram here, we see our pelvis is a basin-shaped ring of bones and sitting at the bottom of our pelvis is our pelvic floor muscles, okay? And if you look at the other diagram where we have the diaphragm and the core muscles shown, I teach the patients if you think of a can of coke, you think of your abdominal pelvic canister, okay? So your pelvic floor is the base of the pan. Sitting at the top, you have your diaphragm and then the abdominal or your core muscles are wrapping around so they are the cylinder and everything needs to be working optimally um, when we take a breath in our diaphragm relaxes and that relaxes our pelvic floor and it's very important that after we contract our pelvic floor we tighten our pelvic floor that we allow everything to relax so if you think of that nice breath in Pop your hand on your tummy as you breathe in, you'll feel your tummy muscles rise into your hand. Diaphragm is relaxing, your pelvic floor is relaxing. Now I want you to take a breath out and as you breathe out, gently squeeze the muscles around your back passage and front passage, imagining you're trying to stop yourself passing wind and hold. Lovely and breathe in and relax those muscles. Fabulous. Another way, um, uh, another cue I like to use, if you get your two hands and just pop your hands underneath your bottom, so your two sitting bones are on your hand, this is a nice way for women to kind of get that visual uh, or proprioceptive feedback. You breathe in to relax your diaphragm, relaxing your pelvic floor. As you breathe out, gently squeeze the muscles around your back and front passage as if you're trying to stop 
wind or the flow of urine and hold. Lovely, and um, breathe in to relax. And generally, um, I start women, you know, holding for as long as they're able. But again, it's very individual. The exercise prescription is very individualized. But if you are managing and able to hold your contraction, you start maybe with five second hold, five second release, and you're building that up and you're aiming to get to between eight to 10 seconds. Um, and the important thing, as I mentioned, is that you're relaxing in between each repetition. Okay. And if there are other issues, if it's not purely stress incontinence, if, you, if you're in doubt and if you're having issues like painful sex, which we're going to come on to next, then I would definitely recommend that review with a women's health physiotherapist. Controlling the controllables. So the vaginal symptoms, the dryness, the itching, that dyspareunia or painful sex, these are symptoms that some women will suffer in silence. They'll not speak to anybody and it can really affect your quality of life. You need to communicate. You need to talk to your partners or husbands. Let them know because there's lots that you can do to help. With urinary tract infections, making sure you're looking at your good fluid intake. Cranberry juice can be nice as a preventative as well. When we're looking at somebody who's very dry, and again, this is something that I would see quite commonly with menopausal and postmenopausal women, that they'll be very dry and the sex will be painful. So you can use lubricants. Organic products are the best to use, and we always recommend a water-based lubricant, especially if you're using condoms. Um, lubricants that I would recommend would be the Yes um, lubricant or Silk. You can also discuss the use of topical estrogens with your GP. And for anybody who's not able to, or the GP is not um, recommending a topical estrogen, there are vaginal moisturizers that may help as well. And these are something that you can get over the counter at a pharmacy. These are all tips that might help improve that dryness, making your sex more comfortable. And also a visit to a women's health physio who can assess the muscles internally. And there are treatments that will calm muscles down and you know, hopefully help you get back to enjoying sex again, okay? So I've got some references for the links as to where those lubricants um, are available at the back. But always as well, if you're looking at topical estrogens, you do need to discuss that with your GP, okay? In terms of bone health, did you know that after the age of 50, we lose 1% of our leg strength per year? So this is very significant. I mentioned earlier that um, estrogen is that anabolic hormone. So what can we do to help? I think it's important to be aware that those niggly Achilles tendinopathies, um, plantar fasciitis, these are common in menopausal women. And again, all linked to that depletion of estrogen. Again, you can go and see a physiotherapist. It can be a musculoskeletal physio, it doesn't need to be a women's health physio for these issues. But it's really important as well that you make good diet and lifestyle choices. And I know there's been a fabulous um, work done um, on nutrition, so I'm not going to go into that too much. But think about your calcium, think about your vitamin D supplements. They all help um, maintain bone density. Vitamin D helps with the absorption of calcium. So it's really, really important that you make good choices during perimenopause and menopause as well, ladies. And finally, the protective role of exercise. The recent guidelines from the World Health Organization in 2020 stated that we need to achieve at least 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity per week. And in that, this should include two strength training sessions involving all the major muscle groups. So this is really, really important to help maintain your bone health. And exercise has so many benefits, including helping you to sleep better, helps with weight loss, combat stress, and just generally improves your quality of life. Did you know also that one in four adults do not meet these global recommendations? So this is something that you could start with. You know, getting out for a walk is really good. That weight bearing, you know, getting, you know, some weight, starting doing some gentle strength training working. And again, you can just use your own body weight, you know, things like squats and out and about walking is also very good. But it's just so important that, you know, this is a time in your life 
where you can set yourself up and optimize your health. You have probably been being so busy, you know, you know, if you've had children running around supporting your family throughout the years, climbing the career ladder, you know, what I'd like you to do is just pause, you know, invest in your health, invest in that next chapter of your life and make it a really positive, good one. Thank you very much, ladies. And I'm looking forward to questions. My final slide is references and some lovely patient-friendly resources. Thank you. Thank you, Charlene. Great, great information there again, very informative and practical. And it's just wonderful to know that um, there's such a thing as a women's health physiotherapist and that can be accessed to GP referrals. Uh, so that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Charlene. Um, and again, just a reminder that tonight has been recorded and that you can watch back. Uh, we'll be sending out the link to you in the next seven to 10 days. OK, so now we're going to go back to our community women again, and we're just going to hear a little bit more from them. So um, this time we asked them the question, what supports did you access? I haven't been to a doctor about it at all and I'm, and I'm 57. We'll ask questions more than our parents did and our kids coming up are going to know more because they're going to ask more than we did. We, we've kind of waited till we went into the menopause nearly to start asking questions about it. Well, yeah, I wasn't a candidate anyway for HRT, so I was just kind of winging it as they say. You're just going through it and hoping that you'll come out the other side and you'll be still sane. So I went to my GP um, around that time and I, when I went into her I kind of said I think I think I need to get blood stone and I think I could be there's there's something wrong with me and she just started laughing at me and she said what do you mean you, you think there's something wrong or you think you could be menopausal she said you clearly are I was there with a big red face and a big red neck and the sweat was pouring off me and she told me to come back in a few days if I wanted to make a decision about going on or off HRT so to me it was a no-brainer I went on it at 48 and I have never looked back. And I probably have more energy now than I had throughout my mid thirties and forties. And I had, um, what are those scans called? The, uh, oh, what's that scan called? DEXA scan. Yeah, I had a DEXA scan and it showed that I was osteopenic. And that was probably now in my, in my, in my forties. So really what I actually did do was just address my own lifestyle. I mean, this ain't rocket science. This is what we should be doing all the time anyway, is looking at, am I getting enough exercise? Am I, have I cut out, you know, a certain type of food? Like, and I'm, you know, keep away from the hot stuff and, you know, cut out coffee and drink more water. And, um, you know, the big joke is I never drank enough anyway. To, I would have in my heyday, but now that's a non-existent thing. I don't smoke, which would be another contributor to the effects of menopause and stuff like that. So most of what I would have, been doing was good. I've been a good girl, but not a great girl. But I went back and I lo looked at my lifestyle choices. So I actually did. I, I started to reduce my weight, um, which creeps up as well, which is another part of it. You know, your me metabolism changes too. My lovely health care professional colleague um, asked me to join a Facebook page, The Irish Menopause. And it was there. I found my tribe, literally. I realised one, I'm not alone, uh, two, I'm not going mad, and three, the, the mantra that everyone keeps saying is, I want to be me again. And when I met my menopause specialist, that's what I said to her, I just want to be me. And she said she hears it every day, every day. And unfortunately, you know, to access all that, you have to have money, you have to be able to do it privately, because we don't have a system where you can go into a clinic. Now they're talking about it, but it's 2021. I mean, anyone that I meet, you know, friends or colleagues at work or whatever, that, that even suggests to me that, there might, that they might be menopausal, I'm saying just go to your GP or find somebody really, you know, who knows what they're at. Find, find a GP who's done something in women's health or is interested and just have, have a look at what's out there for you because there's so many options now. So interesting again and to hear how 
um, each woman, each woman finds her own journey um, or has had to find her own journey um, in making making her way in that in, in menopause, in that menopause transition. OK, so next we're going to move on tonight to meeting a uh, lady, Dr. Nolig Moore. Uh, Nolig is a clinical psychologist who works here in the Midwest community healthcare area. Um, she works in our mental health services with adults um, with moderate to severe mental illness. She's qualified in mindfulness teacher and integrated mindfulness, compassion and body based interventions into her work with clients. Nolig, you're very, very welcome. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Bedelia. I'm just going to share my screen now, so I'm just a little bit distracted doing that. Uh, now, uh, I'll just go back to the beginning. Good evening, everybody. I'm delighted to be here and to see that there's so many people tuning in, whether you're sitting there with a nice big cup of tea, um, looking in on your on your lap, laptop or iPad or phone, or just you might have us on in the background. Um, so I'm just really going to look at a, a few of the common psychological features, really, or psychological symptoms of the menopause. So what they look like, um, how we can relate to them and how we can manage them. Um, and I suppose something that, that Dr. Cassie brought up is, you know, how we relate to the symptoms really does have an impact on even at times the severity of the symptoms and the frequency of the symptoms. So sometimes when we don't have the information, the way we relate to the symptoms can be from a place of fear. So it's just wonderful that we're, we're getting so much information because at least it can reduce the unknown, which, which is a really important thing. I suppose first, not that we need reminding about the midlife context, but you know, sometimes as women, I think it's just important to recognize, you know, the 40s, the 50s, it's like there's so much going on in life anyway. So, you know, there's life changes, there's stressors, you know, you could be grieving for your for parents, there could be um, caring for elderly parents, parenting your children, there might be young children or teenagers, maybe children leaving home, some bit of that empty nest syndrome. Um, family illness, managing work and home, um, meeting work demands, financial stresses, relationship problems, separation, divorce. You could be newly single and dating again, or you know, living with COVID, which what we've been doing for the last two years. And of course, even aging. And you know, there might be conflicting emotions for us as regards aging. You know, just changes in our bodies and even changes to our reproductive status. So this is all happening already just because of the phase of life we're in. And then, as I'm saying there on the slide, it's midlife context and the change. So now we already have those things happening in our lives in terms of the, the stressors and life changes. And, you know, when you think of yourself maybe as the resources you have and the demands, so what's going out, but then when you put the symptoms of, of menopause and perimenopause on top of that and you know as Cassie said up to 33 34 symptoms and I suppose up to 80 percent of women are going to experience these symptoms to various varying degrees and you know varying degrees of severity or disruption in our lives so we have an awful lot going on and I suppose maybe to to take that to take a pause even tonight and just acknowledge that you know, we already have a lot going on in our lives, even before the perimenopause, you know, before that starts. So you might feel that you were just kind of managing, getting through all of those demands. And there's maybe people, you know, you caring for people and looking after for people and doing all of the things. And now we have nearly an, another stressor, another demand. But I suppose one thing that can come from maybe this time of our lives is that if you, especially if you were somebody who, is caring for other people and always being on last on the list. So maybe with the symptoms, there is that it focuses our attention that we actually have to look after ourselves now. So it might be saying no and really focusing more on yourself. And as Jack Cornfield says, he's a psychologist and a meditation teacher. He said, as if you have respect for yourself and patience and compassion, and with these, you can handle anything. So I suppose even just to, to keep that in mind as we're, as we're just going through talking about the psychological symptoms. 
So I'm going to talk about brain fog and anxiety and depression. They're like maybe three of the more common kind of things that people, people would talk about. So then for brain fog can be very troubling for people. And I suppose it's really the cognitive impairment. And there's some studies that talk about a window of vulnerability for cognitive difficulties, particularly memory, beginning in early menopause transition, and then ending for some women and for most men, women post-menopause. So, you know, if you've experienced things and we have a, a poll there, and you might just, if you want to use that function, just to answer that question, have you experienced symptoms like forgetfulness, you know, forgetting a word mid-sentence, forgetting names, poor concentration, finding it hard to focus and to put your thoughts into words. We saw in one of the videos that one of the, one of the ladies really was struggling with that and also confusion. And I suppose we have touched, I suppose the other speakers have touched in terms of estrogen. Um, and this has a potent impact on the brain and especially in midlife on memory performance. And I suppose a lot of people, you know, would say as well that they didn't actually, they don't, don't know what's going on. They wouldn't really have seen this. And that, that could be another question that's in there too in the, in the poll. Whether you put down these kind of symptoms as to be, okay, this might be perimenopause or whether you just thought, oh God, I'm just maybe really stressed out and that's what it is. So for some people too at work, and I think one of the ladies in the video spoke about that, how up to 25% of women could consider, consider leaving work because they just feel like they're not actually able to function in work. And even when it gets, when people really don't know what's happening and you know, you might walk into a room and go, God, why, I actually don't know what, what I've come in here for. Um, some people fear that it could be the early onset dementia, that they're, this is what's happening. And especially if they're, you know, their mom or aunt or, you know, elderly parent has dementia, it can be absolutely terrifying. And they can hold that it just doesn't maybe come into their head that it actually is perimenopause. So, okay, I think this has, I'm just looking, it seems to have frozen my presentation, but I'll keep on going. These are things that happen. So Nalik, then, sorry, Nolik, hi, if you, hi, if you bring your cursor to the bottom left-hand corner of the screen and just click, it'll potentially bring okay. up, there you go. Oh, there we are. Lovely. It's great to have someone on Helena around, especially when there might be a bit of brain fog. So Helena, I wish I had you every day when I just kind of lose my way and I'm not too sure where I'm going. So what, what can help? I mean, I suppose we'll all mention exercise. I mean, exercise is good for promoting um, brain health. Also, you know, just simple things like making lists of priorities for, for the next day. You know, it might be we're, we're kind of lucky now that we have phones and we can put reminders on or the post-its. Um, so any kind of strategy that you find helpful, I would say just use those strategies just to get through those moments. Reduce multitasking. Now, in all fairness, multitasking is overrated, but especially when we're um, when our working memory, when we're just finding it hard to focus and maybe hold a number of things a number of things in our head, then multitasking isn't, isn't really the way to go. Stay hydrated. So that's vital for brain function. And also if we can regulate the blood sugar. So, you know, the, the brain likes a steady flow of glucose and then own up. There was one of the ladies in the video and she said, you know, that she play charades, you know, when she can't think of something at work. And I just thought it was just a lovely example of we just normalizing this and, and normalizing it for ourselves that are going through the, the menopause, but also educating and informing people that, you know, this is why I'm just getting stuck mid sentence here. Um, and then the good news is that the memory improves again post menopause. So we'll move on then to anxiety. And I suppose anxiety is a common mood symptom and it can be experienced by some menopausal women. And I suppose as well, if you can, with the poll, if you can just maybe say yes or no, whether you would have experienced the symptoms of anxiety. Um, just put that down. So things like irritability, uh, nervousness, tension, feeling fearful for no reason. 
and that racing heart. And I suppose, again, it is the 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 falling levels of the hormones and they influence the way the 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 balance of hormones in the brain. I suppose if you think of the hormones, it's nearly like an ecosystem. So, you know, with the reduction of the sex hormones, it's going to have that knock-on effect on, on other hormones and neurochemicals. So what we see is there is a lowering of the serotonin, and that's linked to mood regulation and your body stress response, and of course, as well to the memory function. And we also see that lowering of the endorphins. And we know these are to increase our feelings of well-being and pleasure. And then there's an increase of the, the cortisol and the adrenaline, and there are stress hormones. So then you can see there the irritability, nerves, nervousness. So the symptoms, they may occur randomly um, in response from, uh, to a stressful situation, or they may be intermittent, maybe lasting a few minutes to hours, or they may be, there might be that mild ongoing sensation of feeling uneasy. I know for me, sometimes with this, I'm not really feeling anxious in my head. I don't have that anxious thinking, which I'll, I'll, kind of, I'll mention, but it's nearly like I'm after about three or four espressos. It's kind of like there's a, there's a surge in the body. And also just I'm waking up anxious. That might be something that some of you might notice. And um, there is a cortisol peak in the morning time, and that's really to rouse us, to get us going. But when we don't have that dampening effect of the serotonin and the endorphins, then we really feel that the anxiety and the jitteriness may be a little bit more. So sometimes if you can just be really organized in the morning, that may be hard because you might be trying to get people and yourself out of, out, of, out of the house. And it can be hard. It could lead maybe to more kind of anger or kind of irritability because really your body is, is quite hyper aroused. Just going to mention as well anxious thinking, I suppose there's a flavor and a theme in anxious thinking and we call it catastrophizing. Um, now this can be, this can trigger anxiety, but it also maintains anxiety. And it really is when we overestimate the likelihood of the worst case scenario, but then we underestimate or our ability to cope. And then what you, when we are thinking in this way, it automatically then increases these symptoms up here, the irritability, the nervousness, the tension, the, the feeling fearful, the physiology, the more the physiological symptoms. So again, we're you're gonna notice from my talk, there's a lot of circular kind of vicious circles, one thing feeding into another and, and then the bi-directionality bi of it. So, I'm just going to mention cognitive behavior therapy, that model. Um, Dr. Cassie would have mentioned that as a, a very effective intervention for, for the, the psychological symptoms, especially if they're more in the kind of moderate or severe range, or even if they're really impacting of the quality of your life. So with the CBT model, really it focuses us to look at the links between or what we think, our thoughts, our behaviors, our bodily sensations, and our emotions. So the way we think about the symptoms in certain situations tends to affect how we feel and then what we do. And these reactions in turn will have an increase, of, will increase the intensity of the bodily reactions. So there has been research, which, which uh, Dr. Cathy mentioned as well, that CBT, and it was a kind of a group CBT intervention, which is always a lovely way as well, because you have that, I'm not the only one experience that's experiencing this in a group intervention, but that CBT for hot flushes did reduce the severity and also the frequency. And I suppose really what it was, was that we were starting to change our relationship to the symptom, because, you know, this is happening. And, you know, there, there may be for some people, the option of HRT may, may, may help with symptoms. And as Dr. Cassie said, it's not going to be the panacea, but it's, you know, when we meet a symptom with a more calm kind of, um, what's the word, just, we, we will feel like we're more in control. So if you're watching it, for those of you that are listening, I'm going to apologize, but I'm, I'm going to try to explain this as best as I can. So I'm just giving an example 
um, using that, kind, that CBT model. And it's of the anxious thinking. So if any of you have had the experience of waiting, waking up at 3 a.m. in the morning, and I'm thinking there could be quite a few of us now that might have this experience. You wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and you are bright awake. And then the thoughts, remembering the, the catastrophizing, so, oh my God, it's 3 a.m. in the morning. I have a busy day tomorrow. I'll be totally wrecked and I won't be able to cope. And I'll get in trouble at work because, you know, I already have the brain fog and I'm forgetting things. So that's what we're thinking. And then the feeling, we're starting to feel anxious, stressed, worried, annoyed. So when we're feeling that, and in this example, the, the woman might actually get out of bed and just go, oh, I'm just going to go down, get out the laptop and start going through my emails, you know, get a start on the day. So then she finds herself at the kitchen table going through work emails at 3 a.m. in the morning. So then we look at the body, what's actually happening in the body. So she's feeling hot, her heart is jumping, her head is pounding, and there's that edgy kind of feeling. And if you see, there's a bit of a vicious circle starting to go on here then. And even imagining, you know, what state she's going to be in looking at work emails when she's in this state. So there better not be any alarming, troublesome emails there because it's, it's only going to go downhill. So she may find herself oh, at seven o'clock now. Sure, I might as well just stay up altogether. Now, when we look at the thoughts, it can be important just to ask ourselves a, a couple of questions. It's like if my best friend just appeared in the bedroom, you know, what would she say to me? Or if my friend was in this situation, what would I say to her? So my friend might say, or using that question, what would I say to myself, you know, if this is my best friend talking, or what would I say to my best friend? And it could be, I've actually managed before, so I know I can cope. You know, I've woken up in the middle of the night before, and I've always thought maybe that tomorrow is going to be brutal, and it actually, I'm tired, but it's not a total disaster. So I've managed. And then with thinking this, we then can start feeling a little bit calmer, a little bit okay. And then the behavior is she might just say, I'm going to practice a little bit of belly breathing. So that slow, steady breathing. And the belly breathing is if you breathe in for four counts and if you breathe out for four counts. So we're really purposely trying to slow down the breath. Sometimes when I find myself awake at three o'clock in the morning, I put just the palm of my hand down there on my lower abdomen, just below around my belly button. And I bring my awareness to the sensations. And as I breathe in, the belly is rising. And I say rising in my head. And as I breathe out, the belly is falling. So then I'm saying rising and falling. I might have one of those catastrophizing thoughts and I just go, okay, I'm going to bring my attention back and the rising and the falling. So you're really trying to slow down the stress response and bring yourself down. And then, you know, this lady puts on some soothing music as well. So then we see, well, what effect does this have on the body? So the heart starts slowing down, the tension starts releasing. Just and three minutes now, Nolik. And then there's okay. a cooling down. Um, so then the thought of I'll deal with tomorrow when tomorrow comes. So then what can you do then? I'm going to need to go a little bit over Bedelia because I was a little bit late starting. Um, so the paced breathing and just developing a calmer, self-supporting internal dialogue. So is there really a threat here? So I'm lying here in bed at three o'clock in the morning. I don't know how tomorrow is going to be. What would a close friend say? What would I say to the close friend? And how can I best mind myself? Have I managed this before? So. Also with the anxiety, meditation can be helpful. I have put into the, the chat, there is a Pelusa meditation um, website and they do mindfulness-based stress reduction. It's free. Now it is self-directive. It isn't interactive, but it's all there if you wanted to go through it. Um, also yoga. Again, the exercise, reducing the smoking the, or quitting the smoking, the alcohol, I'm going to say sleep well helps the anxiety, but we know that's a vicious circle. Um, and then connecting with friends is very important, especially if we can, if they're friends that are understanding and they give us a bit of a different perspective. And then taking a break, you know, those times around irritability, it could be important just to say, I'm just going to go out and take a deep breath. 
and then asking for help. I think it's really important to ask for help. And in my work down through the years, people avoid asking for help. And when I ask them, you know, how is it it's took, taken you so long to come for help? Or even this could be just asking for help within your family or with your friends. And they would say, I don't want to be a burden on people. And if I ask for help, people might think I can't cope. So I'm going to quickly, very quickly go through the depression. So 18% of women in early perimenopause would ex could experience depression and 38% of those in, in late perimenopause. So women in perimenopause are more at risk than in postmenopause for depression. Again, just like with the anxiety, um, those who might have a history of depression, maybe if you receive treatment for depression in the past, um, you may be more likely to develop the depression um, if there may be a relapse during, during menopause. And also if you have quite significant, I suppose, severe PMT, that just shows that the mood is quite sensitive to the hormone changes. And then looking at the symptoms, anger, low mood, decreased self-esteem, feelings of isolation, worthlessness, decreased libido, and low energy. And then the depressive thinking is more really about being critical of yourself, and being negative about, um, I suppose, yourself and also about the future and about the world in general. And we can get into a cycle of self-criticism and hopelessness, and then we can end up withdrawing. And I suppose when we do that, then the, the depressive feelings and the depressive symptoms will only get worse. And again, looking to see how we meet the symptom of, of the the menopause and in this situation it's when you have absolutely no energy and the thinking here is more negative so I'll just go through it really quickly because I am conscious of the time so finding yourself having absolutely no energy and then what goes through this woman's this woman's head is oh for god's sake I should be able to do all the housework I'm losing my grip I'm just not good enough anymore I should really cop on and then the feelings with that are frustration, sadness, depression, disappointment. And then she just decides to go to bed and cry. And then the, body, the sensations in her body feeling empty, muscles aching, sore, heavy. So then if, again, using that of what would you say to a friend in this situation? Or what would a friend say to you? So I'm tired. It doesn't mean that I'm not good enough. I've done a lot already. And then maybe feeling more content and proud. And then the behavior is actually, I'm going to put my feet up and get a cup of tea. And then the body, again, the muscles are going to be relaxing, the chest easing. And then that lovely self-compassion, I'm actually okay. And going through the menopause, I just need to give myself a break. So then what helps? If you find that you have withdrawn and the activity has gone down, it's really important to just start to gradually do things that you enjoy. You know, we call it kind of scheduling pleasant, pleasant activities. Get out for the exercise again, the smoking, cutting down the smoking and the drinking excessively. Really important to meet up with your friends. Really important with family members that won't drain you, that will actually um, give you a different perspective and be supportive of you. Um, the diet and the sleep. Gratitude. This is a lovely practice where you can put down three things you're grateful for um, every day, and they could be just small things. I'm really grateful that I have Helena that would came in and just helped me when I couldn't find my, my screen share. And again, developing more of a compassionate voice. I would, I have something put in there, um, a website, Kristen Neff. There's a lot in terms of self-compassion exercises in that. And really the question, is it an accurate view to really say I'm not good enough? I'm just experiencing a symptom that is related to the perimenopause or menopause. And what would the close friend say? And what would I say to a close friend? Again, it's so important to ask for help and not to suffer in silence. So I know I had to sort of fly through a little bit, but just to finish, and this is, a, this is just a quote from Dr. Jen Gunter. She is a gynecologist in America, and she calls herself a fierce advocate for women's health. And this is what she tells herself when she experiences a hot flush. She says, I am feeling this because women have evolved to drive humanity forward. And this is a sign of my strength. So I'm going to finish up with playing a clip of another fierce, strong lady, and you might recognize her. So Helena or Jean, I'm going to ask you to play it for me. Thank you, everybody. And I think we found it. Is that maybe a little young? 
I don't know. Exactly how old do you think I am? And not that it matters, but I am 50 fucking two and I will rock this dress. I'll get you a changing room. I'm sorry, but um, do you have any drugs in your luggage? No, just my hormones. You got to be kidding me. I am sorry, it is just a UAE law. But they're all natural. They're made from yams. Okay. Uh, I need to speak to an ambassador or an embassy or someone in menopause. Samantha, please calm down. This is getting very, very midnight okay. express. Fine, take them. Without those creams and vitamins, I will go ricocheting back into menopause. Relax, it's one week. Tell that to the beard I'll be growing. Well, Nolig, I'm telling you now, I'm going to practice my gratitude and thank you. Thank you for your presentation. It was wonderful and full of just practical advice. And we always, I suppose, when it comes to looking after our mental health, um, maybe we're not so good as we are with looking after our physical health. So it's always good. There was really practical advice that we can all apply. I think we can all relate to a lot of the feelings that you talked about tonight. Um, so thank you for so much for sharing all that with us. And thank you for a little uh, that clips of Sex in the City and take us all back memory lane and let's go and watch that movie again. OK, folks, so now we're moving on to the next part of our night. Um, we're going to meet um, the health and well-being team here in the Midwest Community Healthcare area. Um, so we're going to see some recordings done by my team. Um, you're going to meet Christine Gurnett, who's our senior dietitian, and she's going to talk to you about managing those extra few pounds that we all um, worry about during that minute, during our menopause, and maybe the proper the foods that we could eat to enhance our bone health. We're going to meet Sinead Killeen and our physical activity team, who are going to give us simple tips on staying active. Um, and we're going to meet Rachel Meskel, who is going to talk to us a little bit about giving up the cigarettes during menopause and why that's such a good idea. And finally, we're going to meet Mairead Kelly. Um, Mairead is our health promotion and improvement offer, officer with a special interest in sexual health. And Mairead is going to talk to us a little bit about our sexual relationships um, and looking after our sexual health in menopause. So handing it over now. Okay. Hi, my name's Christine. I'm a community dietitian here in the Midwest. Good food is a good investment in your health. Lots of women feel obliged to look after other people before they look after their own health. Sometimes that's to the detriment of ourselves. I hear all the time from mothers that tell me, I wouldn't cook or eat or buy those foods because no one else in the house would eat them except me. Where would I get the time to cook for myself? As we get to the age where we experience menopause, it is time to think more about ourselves and remember that if you don't mind yourself, then you can't mind somebody else either. In addition, it can be a stressful time of life between looking out for maturing children, career changes, and aging parents. Menopause is seen as a positive time in some cultures. It's called the second age or the second spring. If you think back to the years when we went through adolescence and all the physical and hormonal changes we went through then, you could see this as similar in ways, or perhaps the end of that period of our life. Our body is changing again, and we may have to make lifestyle changes to counteract some of the health challenges that it brings. Our hormones went crazy for a while then, and they're having a last fling now. For me, maintaining a healthy weight and getting enough exercise has always been a factor. It still is, but it's even more important, and I make even more of a priority now. From a nutrition perspective, we get hit with a double whammy in menopause. With menopause, we have falling hormones and aging with what that means for our body as well. Falling hormones, we get increased insulin resistance, a risk for diabetes, and we begin to store fat around our middle, which is a risk for our heart and cardiovascular disease. We find at this age that we have less protection from cholesterol and menopause can increase our blood pressure. Plus, we have a slower digestive system. The other biggie for us is that menopause affects bone density and our bones can become more brittle and easier to break. This is referred to as osteoporosis. And although we are losing some bone from our mid-30s, it speeds up for a few years around menopause and we can lose a lot of bone strength. 
There are also the hot flashes, the mood swings, the night sweats, and the increased UTIs. There's some evidence that menopause can be harder on women with health problems already, so we need to keep ourselves in the best shape possible. At the same time, we have the aging factors coming into play. With a decrease in lean muscle mass, which burns less calories, there's a decrease in metabolism, weight gain, and an increase in constipation. All sounds terribly depressing, but keep in mind that we can do something about most of this with good nutrition and exercise. In addition, although our body shape is changing, we can still keep it healthy with some lifestyle changes and eating well. It is part of your natural life cycle and everybody's menopause experience is different. So, in nutrition terms, by eating well, I'm referring to a well-balanced diet with lots of variety. It's not about one or more superfoods. There isn't any one superfood that's going to solve this one for us. So let's look at that a bit and see what we can do to help counter the effects of menopause and aging. As previously mentioned, during and after menopause, the biggest threats to our health are protecting our cardiovascular system and maintaining our bone health. So let's start with those two. So I'd say eat food, not too much, and mostly plants. A good healthy diet like a Mediterranean diet, for example, is really helpful. A diet that includes lots of fruits and vegetables, beans, nuts, whole grains, and it's high in fiber. It includes fish, unsaturated fats like olive oil, with a low intake of lean meat, low fat dairy, and less saturated fats in general. Lots of protection for your heart there. Our National Healthy Eating Guidelines and other resources like food plans and portion information are available on the HSC website, Healthy Ireland's Healthy Food for Life. And they're very helpful tools. Using the national guidelines, we can think in terms of plant-based meals and ensure that at least half our plate is filled with veggies or fruit, a quarter with complex carbs and a quarter with a protein source. Starting your menu planning with veggies and carbohydrates before you consider a meat or protein source is such a healthy way to plan for healthy eating. Avoid using too much salt, that's also important. Many of the processed foods in our modern food system are full of salt, and so it's another good reason to avoid processed foods in general. I also encourage people not to have a salt cellar on the table. There's generally enough salt already added in the cooking and from the ingredients in the cooking process. Even organic sea salt is still bad for us if we have too much of it. If your blood pressure is raised, a low salt diet is key to treating it. Include some omega-3 oils may help with symptoms and it's good for your health. Oily fish such as salmon, trout, anchovies, and flax and chia and hemp seeds and unsalted nuts are all good sources of these healthy fats. Whole grains and cereals have lots of fiber and B vitamins, which can help with a slower metabolism and constipation. Plus they fill us up so we're not so hungry. Maintaining a healthy weight is really important. In menopause, we tend to gain weight around our middle, and that raises our risk of cardiovascular disease and other chronic illness. Choosing healthy options, low-fat cooking methods, monitoring your portions, and getting adequate physical activity are all part of keeping yourself at a healthy weight. Eating consistent meals helps your metabolism, and it maintains your blood sugar levels. There is some evidence that skipping meals may bring on hot flashes, and that regular meals may help. You often end up very hangry and tired, so you overeat as a result. So definitely don't skip meals. Unfortunately, our calorie needs are decreasing, and we just need to adjust for this with portion size, avoiding excess calories from high sugar and high fat foods, whole grains and cereals, plus low fat cooking methods, and also physical activity is key. Label reading is such a useful skill and there is a lot of information on the food label. The Irish Heart Foundation has a really helpful label reading card for your wallet and there's a leaflet to explain the process to you on irishheart.ie. Remember though, getting broader around the middle will probably happen and it's okay if we keep an eye on it and it's just a little. Even Twiggy disguises her waist these days. Supporting our bones with calcium and vitamin D is essential. Three servings of low-fat dairy a day 
will get us the calcium and vitamin D that we need. While you can get some calcium from dark green vegetables and some other plant foods, it's really difficult to get enough. If you don't eat dairy foods, then you need to supplement to make sure you get at least 800 milligrams of calcium for your bones. If lactose is a problem, you need to get lactose-free dairy milk. That is still a good source of calcium. If you choose plant-sourced milks, make sure they are supplemented with calcium, and then you can supplement the extra if needed. Calcium is the material our bones are built from, and vitamin D helps the calcium get absorbed into our bones. Vitamin D is difficult to get from food sources, especially in winter when we don't have much sun to activate it. Oily fish, eggs, fortified milks, and lean red meat contain some, but most of us would benefit from a daily supplement of 10 micrograms a day, especially during winter. All of this needs to be supported with weight-bearing exercise as well to protect our precious bones. Again, physical activity is so important at this time of life. Support your bones so they can support you. So I'm sure you've heard of soy and linseed in connection with menopause. They have phytoestrogens in them, and there is some evidence that they can help maybe reduce the severity of hot flashes. But you need to be taking them at least three servings a day, and it takes up to two to three months to feel any benefit. These foods are low in saturated fats and high in antioxidants, so they do have other benefits and are a good addition to your diet. Herbal remedies still lack evidence of benefit for menopause symptoms. The big concern with herbal remedies is that they may interact with the other medications you're taking, so never use them without consulting your health professional. Be aware that just taking something that's natural may not be regulated and the quality and the ingredients vary a lot. You may not be getting what you think you are getting and they may not be safe for you. There is some small evidence that St. John's wort and black cohash may decrease hot flashes, but they can interact with some medications. So always discuss their use with your healthcare provider. If you're buying any of these, get them from a reputable source and don't buy online. There's no evidence of benefit that has been demonstrated for using ginseng, Chinese herbs, or evening primrose oil. There's some evidence that suggests the more hydrated you are, the less you'll suffer from night sweats and hot flashes. And if you have dry skin, it may mean you're not well hydrated. If you're getting lots of these symptoms, you'll need to replace the fluids that you might have lost. Being well hydrated is so important for our bodies and brains to function well. After all, we're about 60 to 70% water. Headaches can occur from dehydration and our skin loses hydration quicker as we age. Water is the best choice for hydration as other options may have a negative effect on hydration status overall. If you add lemon or lime to your water bottle, you could be damaging your teeth from constant exposure to citrus. We often confuse thirst with hunger but sometimes having a glass or two of water between meals will reduce our need to snack. So what might make your symptoms worse or be a trigger for them? There's some evidence that caffeine can trigger and increase severity of hot flashes for some people. And the effects of caffeine last a long time. I myself are very sensitive to caffeine. The recommendation here would be to stick to two cups of tea or coffee or drinks containing caffeine in the day and best not to have any after 2 p.m. The maximum recommended amount of alcohol for women in a week is 11 units. This represents one bottle of wine and one or two drinks over the whole week. There is also some evidence that alcohol may trigger an increased severity of hot flashes and night sweats. Alcohol can increase your blood pressure and can cause liver damage. Remember too, alcohol is a depressant, which will make you feel worse about everything. Also remember that there's lots of calories in alcohol, and when drinking, we often eat less than healthy food despite our best made plans. Let's talk about spicy food. There's little or no evidence that it makes things worse, but some women report that their symptoms increase with it. It seems to be very individual. Stress can make everything worse for us, and your eating plan's no different. When we're stressed, we sometimes comfort eat, we don't plan our meals and we grab whatever is handy or we don't eat at all and then we binge. All of these eating styles make us feel worse and it turns into a cycle. 
Learn to recognize that you're stressed, try some stress reduction techniques, and then get back to healthy eating as soon as you can. Never beat yourself up for not eating well because you're only human and these things happen. Plan to enjoy your food as much as you can. Eating healthy doesn't have to mean depriving yourself. It just means making different choices. Focus on how well you feel when you are eating well and exercising. So just to summarize, there are two biggies that we have to worry about, cardiovascular disease and bone health. We have information on what has been proven to help and what really hasn't, despite what marketing might have you think. Plus, we've talked about what might make your symptoms worse. I've made lots of recommendations here and I don't expect anyone to change everything all at once. I always find that picking one or two changes at a time and promising to work on those is helpful. And as the old saying goes, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Perhaps it sounds like menopause brings a lot of unpleasant symptoms, but it is a natural part of our lives and it isn't all that bad. Many women find this time to be one of renewed interest in life with a new sense of empowerment and self-esteem. In fact, some studies show that optimism increases once you're in your 50s. So welcome to your second spring. We've heard tonight that being physically active helps during the menopause journey and our speakers have discussed some of the health conditions that we are at greater risk of in perimenopause and menopause. So why be physically active? The research shows that being physically active has a positive effect on our mental well-being, helps us maintain a healthy weight, protects our bones and reduces our risk of developing disease of the heart. Being physically active can take many different forms. It might be an exercise class in your local gym, morning jog or 10 minute walk at lunchtime. The changes to our body as we get older and during menopause means we need to do different types of physical activity. There's always a park or a green area where we can get outside for a little bit of exercise. There's all different types of physical activity. Aerobic exercise like walking and jogging involves loading the bones and helps reduce our risk of developing osteoporosis. While cycling and swimming are examples of non-weight bearing aerobic exercise. The other types of exercises are strengthening exercises, where we contract our muscles against some form of resistance. This resistance might be your own body weight, a dumbbell or gravity. These type of exercises help us to maintain muscle mass. Balance and flexibility exercises also have an important role to play. They help reduce our risk of falls and keep the motion that's in our joints. Balance exercises are particularly important if our other systems like our vision and our hearing, which help us with our balance, aren't working as well. The last Healthy Ireland survey tells us that one in three females are doing the 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise recommended over the week. If you're already doing this, well done, keep it up. Maybe reach out and support others. If not, it's never too late to start becoming more physically active. Any movement is better than no movement. Want to know where to start? We will post some useful websites in the emails that follow after this webinar. There is something out there for everyone, regardless of age or capability. And that's all it takes sometimes. So remember, whatever you choose to do, pick something in an environment that motivates you, that you enjoy doing, that fits in with your day-to-day -day routine. That way you give yourself the best chance to stick in with it and getting all the benefits we know that being physically active brings. Hi, I'm Rachel and I want to talk to you about stopping smoking because stopping smoking at any time of life is really important for better health and to live longer. Menopause is an ideal time to stop smoking.
By not smoking, you delay the onset of menopause and you reduce the number of hot flushes. Also, more good news, you can decrease the risk of developing osteoporosis and gum disease. The interplay between smoking and bone health is very complex. If you smoke, the risk of bone fracture is increased by 25%. So really good news. There is an entire team of us here at Quit Midwest ready to help you. You can ring us, you can talk to us, and we can support you as you want to stop smoking. So contact us at Quit Midwest. Oh, and just to make sure that we get the point across, they gave me a really, really big sign to hold up. You won't be able to miss this. Sexual Health, Menopause and Me. Hello, my name is Mairead Kelly and I'm a Health Promotion and Improvement Officer with the HSE Midwest and I have a remit around sexual health promotion. I am based in Limerick. We are all sexual beings and as we embark on the next phase of our lives as perimenopausal or menopausal women, that doesn't change. What can change for some of us is how we experience ourselves as sexual beings. In the years around menopause, we as women may experience some changes in our sex lives. For some, it is more enjoyable as the fear of unwanted pregnancy abates. For others, they find that they think about sex less often or they don't enjoy it as much. Reducing hormone levels during this time may cause vaginal tissues to become thinner or drier, which may make penetrative sex uncomfortable or painful. There are treatments available to help your symptoms. For example, the use of lubricants greatly enhances the experience of sex. There are a wide variety available over the counter in any pharmacy. Just to be mindful, if you are using condoms during sex, that not all lubricants are safe to use with condoms as some reduce their effectiveness. Being less interested in sex as you get older is not a medical condition that requires treatment. Libido naturally goes up and down during one's life course. However, if changes in your sexual health bother you, I recommend that you talk to your GP or practice nurse or other supports that may be available in your area about possible ways to help. Sexual pleasure is a much neglected yet fundamental part of sexual health. Research indicates that sexual pleasure contributes to the quality of life and the quality of intimate relationships both of which support individual and societal well-being. There are many ways to achieve sexual pleasure. Penetrative sex isn't the only way. Touching, stroking, massaging, kissing are some of the many ways in which sexual pleasure can be shared. The key message is to be kind to yourself, to know what's right for you and to enjoy it. I invite you all to own your own sexual pleasure destiny and be creative in how you want to be pleasured and give pleasure in a safe, consensual way. Okay, and thank you to the health and wellbeing team for putting those lovely videos together. I think Boraid said it there in the end, be kind to yourself. Um, and that's our message to you. It's hard to make a lot of changes if you have to make a lot of changes. Just, just pick one or two um, and be nice to yourself on that journey. So finally, I'm going to leave, and I'm, I, we're not going to leave, but I'm going to finish with our, our, our last of our videos um, from our women. And they're going to talk about the positives of menopause. One good experience was that the migraines lessened an awful lot. That's one good thing about it. If anybody, I mean, most women do get hormonal migraines. It's not, it's not, it's, it's not really rare. It's actually very common. And I've, since I was 13, I've been getting them. So that, that would have been when I had started getting periods at yeah. that age, 12 or 13. And when I used to go to the doctor, they were never diagnosed as migraines. They just said that I had bad headaches. My mother didn't know. 
that they were migraines, never even heard of them until I was an adult, until I was went to the doctor constantly saying, and ca calling the doctor to the house because I could be in bed for 24, 48 hours vomiting and not able to see and really bad. And then I was diagnosed as migraine headaches, but I would have been an adult. There's no positivity in the menopause for me. I couldn't only that I can't get pregnant and have babies. I can have, still have sex without having that fear of having babies. And you know what I mean, at my age. <laughs> had subsequent DEXA scans done and they were improved on what they were in my 40s and again as my GP says there's actually a bone health connection to being on HRT and I started running when I was 53. I've done four um, uh, Great Limerick runs, didn't do it in 2020 because of the pandemic. Now at the moment I'm bad because I was just finishing my master's so I didn't actually get to do I didn't get, I'm not doing much running at the moment, but I'm really fit and active and I would not have been at that level at all in my 40s. There's nothing positive about menopause. Are you having a laugh? <laughs> there really isn't. Well, no, there is, because you're warm when everybody else is freezing, so there is a positive. We're great people for saying yes, but learning to say no probably has been the best thing for me. Um, and just stepping back and let other people do things. I don't have to do it all, you know. And that goes for home as well as being a worker in our community, volunteering or whatever we do. Thank you to all those wonderful women for sharing their, their lived experience. Um, I think we can all relate to some or maybe all of what they say. Um, so thank you. So now, Helena, I think we're over to meeting with our board, our, our panel, and we're going to have a, a short Q&A session. We're just running out of a little bit of time, but hopefully we'll get to ask a few questions that have come up tonight. Okay. Great. So great, we have our panel. Um, and before I start, I want to say a special thanks to Katrina, Catherine and Anita um, for the Irish Sign Language tonight and their interpretation. Um, really do appreciate it. Um, and I'm sure it's very much welcomed by the deaf community um, throughout the Midwest, so thank you. Okay, so our questions, we have a few questions. We won't have a huge amount of time for them, but uh, maybe I might just start um, with Dr. Mephi, if, if you don't mind. Um, one question has come in. Can you take HRT after your periods? Um, sorry, yeah, before yeah. your periods. Sorry, sorry I beg your pardon. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so traditionally it was kind of uh, thought you could you needed to wait for a year after your periods finished, um, but uh, you can certainly start HRT when you're still having periods. And in fact, some of the HRTs are specifically designed to be used that way, so you can get a patch. Um, that has continuous estrogen and then your progesterone is there for two weeks of the cycle and not there for the other two weeks. So when we still have periods, we usually need to use the HRT in what we call a sequential fashion. So um, instead of trying to work against the menstrual cycle, we kind of work with it. So we give progesterone to protect the lining of the womb and then we withdraw it again so that women get a kind of scheduled regular bleed. Um, so yeah, you absolutely can, and loads of women really benefit from it in the perimenopause because, as women have said this evening, or some of the speakers, sorry, have said this evening, um, in the perimenopause sometimes the symptoms are nearly worse than okay. in the postmenopausal uh, time of life. Okay, interesting. Thank you, Charlene. I think this next one is is for you. So, how often, um, once you notice improvements in your stress and continence, should you continue with your pelvic floor exercises? Thanks. That's a really good question. Um, it's very important that you remember that your pelvic floor exercises are for life. So there's something that you need to continue it on an ongoing basis. So you will start to notice the improvements within the first um, kind of generally between four and six months. But you do need to continue them. Maybe not every day, but definitely four to five times a week. OK, great, great. Thank you very much, um, Christine. Um, so, Christine, I have a question here. Will I ever lose the weight I gained during menopause? That's a really good question. It's one a lot of people find a concern around menopause when they gain extra weight. But I suppose step one would be to stop any further weight gain. So um, making a few lifestyle changes, uh, looking at portion control, 
looking at where your calories come from, making sure you have regular meals, um, lots of fruits and vegetables and water, and then avoiding top shelf foods. And of course, your physical activity is very important as well. Um, but then I suppose we have to think about how much weight and how much do I need to lose to get to a healthy weight? So if you kind of look back at where you've been, if you've struggled to be at a healthy BMI previously, it might seem a little overwhelming to try to get there now. And I suppose when you think about it, the studies show that if you lose five to 10% of your body weight, you gain a lot of health benefits. So losing about five or 10% of your body weight, you can uh, reduce your blood glucose levels, your blood pressure can reduce, your triglycerides can go down, your LDL, that's your lousy cholesterol, can go down and your total cholesterol can, can go down. On the positive side as well, usually you gain more energy when you um, start to use lose weight and exercise and then your joints don't ache as much either. So once you get into these new habits, you may find that you're happy to stay with them and you may end up losing even more weight. Um, if your weight is around 80 kilos, we'll say getting back down to a healthy BMI of less than 25 would be really difficult. And if you're 80 kilos to lose five to 10%, that would look like a lot less. So it would be like four kilos or about nine pounds or maybe a bit over a half a stone, you'll still get some of the health benefits and it gives you a good start. And you never know when you get there, you might be willing to go on a bit further. Great. So small changes can make a big difference. Great, thanks, Christine. So there's hope, there's hope there, thank you. Um, Maureen, a question for you. Um, I'm now in my fifties experiencing menopause symptom. Does that mean my sex life is over? Good evening. That's a good question, um, Bedelia. I would say no. I would say you would need to, going back to what I said, be kind to yourself and explore what is right for you at this particular time. I think there's a lot of media pressure out there, you know, that's like the new sexual revolution when you hit your 50s and 60s. But if that's not right for you, well, then just be kind to yourself and do what's right for you at this at this particular time. I think it's a time also, maybe you need to check in with your GP or your practice, especially if you're experiencing painful sex. Nobody should experience pain during sex and get advice around the use of lubricants or, or other, um, other things that may help you at, at this particular time. Be also mindful that at this time we might be coming out of long-term relationships and may not need to have worried about the use of protection and we may not even think about it because the fear of pregnancy is now gone. So again, to be mindful around that and be safe. And um, I suppose going back to what Charlene mentioned earlier about making sure that the lubricants we were using are the ones, the proper ones to use with the condoms that we're using so that they, they are most, most effective. So I would just say, just be kind to yourself and do what's right to you and don't be giving into pressure around this time. Okay, great. Thanks Maureen, thank you very much. Nolik, I have a question here. I really struggle with concentration, which has been greatly affected by my ability to, and has greatly affected her ability to work full time. Can I do anything to improve it? Mindfulness actually can be helpful. Now it would be, it's hard though. And now what I mean by that, especially, there is research that mindfulness incre increases attention and control. And I suppose starting with very short practices and it's really, teaching where we put our focus so in mindfulness if the mind wanders which is well it will that's what it does but it's really bringing it back and it's kind of going to the gym for the mind you're kind of increasing that attentional control bit so that might help in terms of concentration great great thank you and thanks to all of our panels and i'd love to do more questions but unfortunately we're out of time um and I want to thank all of you um, for your contributions tonight and to thank um, our six women from the community and for their, um, their lived experience and for sharing that with us. Um, it's been a really informative evening. And I suppose if we were to just kind of to reflect on it in terms of what we can take away, um, I suppose the thing is that impact um, of menopause is different for different people. Um, but what I've learned tonight is there's certainly a lot of solutions out there and there's hope, which is always good. 
Um, and I think more of us that are having this conversation, um, we can normalize it and uh, share any of the stress that might we might be feeling as a result of the of menopausal symptoms and, and that's always positive um so it's all about there's there is right options and they're there for everybody um if i may just before we finish up tonight i just want to thank one particular group of women um and that's my own team um and in particular I want to talk, to thank um, Rachel Meskel um, and Maraid Kelly, Sinead Killeen, Mo Foley and Lydia Behan, who have done amazing work in pulling tonight together and um, have worked really hard behind the scenes. Um, and I'm very grateful to all of you for that. Um, I want to also thank um, Southern Advertising, um, Dave O'Hore for the putting together the beautiful videos that we have tonight. And I want to thank Helena um, and her team um, in IMS and Jean for, um, for, for, for all of tonight and making tonight so easy for us. Um, and just to let you know that there is a poll that's going to be popping up just at the end of the night, just if you would mind giving your own evaluation and just sharing what you've learned, um, your feelings over tonight. And I'm just going to leave you with one quote um, before we leave. And that is, there is wisdom in women talking to each other, but remember the journey is your own. You need to find what works best for you. And that I will conclude our evening of menopause and me. And thank you all most sincerely for being with us tonight. <laughs>